Hello, my name is Dr. Carrie Arnold. I am the program director for evidence-based coaching at Fielding Graduate University. Today is March 16, 2022. Welcome to this space. We are doing a coaching in context webinar brought to you by Dr. Abigail Lynham. We do these monthly and we're excited to bring you the topic today. This is eligible for an ICF CEU. You need to be present for the entire session. I will put an evaluation link in your chat and you will see that towards the end of the session. If you could please complete that within 24 to 48 hours and then you will receive an email from the registrar's office at Fielding with your ICF CEU. And those typically come two to three weeks after the event. We are recording this session. So if you aren't able to stay for the entire thing, please know it will be available on the Fielding website. We will also follow up by email when that's posted. So again, I wanna welcome you into this space. We had over a hundred folks sign up and those who register often can't come to the live event. So we're very excited for those who are here. It's nice to see some familiar faces. These coaching and context webinars are just such a valuable asset to Fielding, and it's our way of bringing you relevant topics that will inform your practice and help you deepen your work as a coach. And so I want to introduce Dr. Abigail Lynham. She is faculty for uh, Fielding Graduate University on the PhD side. She serves in the School of Leadership Studies, specifically in human and organizational development. She is a coach and she's with Pacific Integral, and she's faculty for the Emergent Leadership and Generating Transformative Change Programs, that's a lot of words, in North America, Europe, South Pacific, and Ethiopia. She's also a scorer and coach for, uh, debriefer with Stages International and a qualified administrator of the Intercultural Development Inventory. She has 20 years experience in transformative learning, cross-cultural competence, adult development, coaching, and leadership development. And I'm proud to call her my peer. And Abigail, if you're ready, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I am, thank you so much for the invitation. It's always a, it's a joy and makes me squirm sometimes hearing my own bio. So <laughs> um, welcome everybody. It's so nice to get to do this together. And um, you know, I really, uh, because we're looking at presence, coaching presence, and then also some practices that support presence, I wanna invite us all to give ourselves the gift of our own presence, um, to be present to yourself, each other, and, and what we're up to together today. If you're able, you can turn on your video. If you're not able, we, we fully understand. Um, but I'm imagining that you came to this particular offering because something about presence really calls to you. And the amazing thing is, is we can actually give that to ourselves and, and, our, and the clients that we're working with moment to moment. And it's often the very quality that we seek. So in our crazy world where our attention can be divided in so many ways, actually pulling back from, you know, trying to multitask and all those kind of things actually gives us some of what we're, what we're reaching for, both with ourselves as well as in our work with others. So, so I really invite you and your presence for our time together, and I'm excited to explore the topic. So a couple things, um, I'm going to be drawing on my own practice and experience. I draw on a few different frameworks and some research in the field, and I'll be touching on those later. But what we'll be doing together is practicing. Um, we'll also be, we'll be doing some, I'll be sharing some concepts and definitions and frameworks, but mostly engaging in a conversation, inviting some reflection, um, and then in the second half of our call, we'll, we'll be working with a particular practice. And as we know, these hours, they go by in a flash. And at the same time, as we're encountering and experiencing a sense of presence with one another, ourselves, the moment, sometimes there can be an experience of timelessness. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna aim or, or err on the side of timelessness so that we can enjoy the fullness of the hour that we have. So uh, let's get started. And I'm going to uh, pull up some slides. Here we go. So first of all, I wanna start with a presencing meditation. So I'm going to just guide us through a few minutes of coming present to ourselves, one another, the moment, 
And I want to make the um, distinction that as, as the, the way I orient to this is that presence is not something we do, it's actually something we are. So we can actually relax ourselves, our attention, our, our tendency to want to try to make something happen and actually experience a deeper presence. And there are all kinds of things we can do to enhance presence, to pay attention to when our, our presence is, when we have less access to presence with ourselves and another but fundamentally it's a quality of being. And so that invites already a sense of maybe softening, relaxing, opening up to what's already here. Um, so my meditation visualization is gonna touch into this. You can close your eyes, you can lower your gaze if you're comfortable, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna close my eyes and just invite us into a moment of presence with ourselves in this moment. So as you lower your gaze, just, Take a moment to see if you can make contact with, feel your feet wherever they are in space, on the ground, sitting underneath you. Just feel your feet for a moment. And as you do that, you make contact with your body a little bit and just notice every angle the simplicity of breathing as you sit here in this moment, your breath. From a personal place, coming in and out. And Carrie, if you could help with the muting, that would be helpful. So making contact with our breath in this very moment. And as you make that contact, you might notice how your body is feeling right now, feeling relaxed, comfortable, or perhaps more contracted and some tiredness. Just notice whatever is present in your own physical body in this moment. Notice the quality of your mind, your thought activity, busy, still, pulling your attention in different ways. Just notice the quality of thought and thought activity. And now bring your attention to your heart into the emotional realm, noticing the quality of felt sense experience in the moment, what feelings are present. And as we make contact with these different dimensions of our being, the mind, the heart, the body, we're not trying to change what's happen, but happening, but just to become conscious of what's present. And as we do that, when we can become more intimate with our own experience, sometimes there can be a softening and opening a dropping of attention or awareness, dropping into a deeper, stiller, quieter place, the quality of presence. So beneath all of this activity is always a place in our being that is more still, more at peace, Potentially, we can experience more trust and more of a sense of being at peace with whatever's happening. So I just invite that for the moment. Even amidst the pressures of our days and the tumultuousness in our lives and world, we can always orient to a deeper peace that's available moment to moment that actually is the source of our presence. And as you're ready, we'll open our eyes, come visually present again to one another.
staying in contact with that deeper sense of presence or self. And so again, I wanted to uh, point to that there's these different dimensions of ourselves that actually can support our contact with or sense of presence uh, with ourselves, the moment each other. And so this is a, a visual, an image that draws from Wendy Palmer's work and it points to these different you know, centers of the body, the, the head, the heart, the belly, and also what isn't, um, what isn't labeled in this diagram is that we can, there's this sort of vertical line that, um, that is pointing to alignment of these centers and also the connection to the, to the deeper ground of awareness itself. And so we're gonna talk about and work with the contribution of these different dimensions of our being to presence itself and how we can notice when we have more or less access, um, which affects uh, the presence that we're bringing to our work with others. So this visual here comes from Theory U. It's one of the frameworks that I work with out of um, MIT, Otto Sharmer's work in particular. And as I as we walk through that presencing meditation, I invited us to come, you know, to make to make contact with what, the activity of our mind, activity of our heart, and the activity of our body. And theory U is a way of uh, mapping or tracking a transformative uh, process. And it's the three the three um, kind of doorways to deeper presence are through the mind, the heart, and and the will. Um, opening the mind is, is being aware of and letting go of judgments. Opening the heart is um, letting go of a way that we can remove ourselves from what's happening, or even perhaps it's a voice of cynicism to feel, to feel and find our connection to what's happening. And then opening the will is um, centering in or letting go into, letting go of fear into a deeper sense of trust. And so with Theory U, they talk about presencing. So it's a little bit different than simply coach, pres you know, the coaching presence. But what they mean by presencing is it's a combination of presence and sensing. So as we drop into a deeper presence with ourselves, the moment, one another, then we can actually sense the, um, the future that wants to emerge, the highest possibility for the individual that we're working with, for ourselves, for a group that we might be engaging. Um, and so the, the reason I was sharing this is just to, uh, just to reconnect to the idea that as we're aware of judgments, as we're aware of the ways that our heart can get, um, you know, perhaps reactive as, the way, as, as we're aware of the fear that can arise when we maybe feel in over our heads, we can work to release those judgments, open the heart and, and to find a deeper trust. And that itself can really allow for a deeper movement um, with whatever it is that we're engaging with. So here's some of the qualities that, um, that both the research points to and also I've encountered in my own work around deepening presence. Um, so just take a moment to take these in. So somatic awareness, that's something we've engaged already. We talked a little bit about trust, empathy and compassion, a deeper listening, awareness of our own emotions, contextual and cultural awareness. So we can notice how each of these qualities can also pull us out of presence when they get challenged. Um, again, being aware of, do we have more or less access to presence in, in any particular moment? And then working with the qualities of the mind to the extent that we can have focused attention, that we can be in curiosity and a sense of not knowing. Um, so these are some of the qualities that support uh, a, a deeper presence. And now gonna engage us in a, in a reflection exercise. So. Just take a moment to take in this beautiful image, notice um, the qualities of presence, what it evokes in you, what this uh, sort of metaphor or, or being with the earth, um, you know, in their gaze, what it, what it speaks to in terms of what this, you know, you could say this individual is present to. Um, and I have a couple of reflection questions. So as you consider a, a time where, where either somebody was fully present to you or you were fully present to another, 
What did that feel like? What supported it? And what impact did it have on you? So I'm gonna put those questions in the chat um, and I wanna invite you to just reflect on them a little bit. And then as, as you start to come to an answer, you can share your response in the chat and also um, we'll hear from a couple folks. So hang on a moment. So again, I'm inviting you to remember a time where either you felt fully present to another or another was fully present with you and what the impact of that experience was and what supported it. And as you start to remember, recall an experience like that, you can share a little bit in the chat. Time flying by, as Carrie shared. So that sense of timelessness, <clears throat> stepping up to our own engagement, not trying to find the answer, but to listen. Safety, relaxation, peace, spaciousness. in a sense of flow. Totally focused. Timelessness released. Deep connection. connection during a time in this world where there's so much distraction, so much pulling on our attention. So, um, so we, can, we can see in, the, um, in what people are sharing, first of all, there's, there's some real commonalities to how people are describing what it, what it feels like to be in presence uh, with ourselves and, and one another, um, an experience of the in-between No need to struggle to be heard, validated, affirmed. Yeah, it's a really beautiful, um, it's, a, it's a beautiful experience that is foundational to the quality of our work with others. And in a way it's paradoxical, right? Because as we, if and as we, we try to be present, it often pulls us out of presence. And so one of the ways, this is a metaphor um, that I use is one of the ways I like to think about presence is, is you know, if, I, if I'm with another person and I'm trying to listen or I'm trying to be present, my attention is going out from me to the other um, and there's a lack of trust and a lack of relaxation. And so what we're seeking here is that is a sweet spot between um, a relaxed presence that is also attentive and so I like to think of it as instead of, you know, I, I'm visually, I think about kind of going out from my own eyes or self to the other as a trying to be present and opening to presence. I, I imagine more of an open circle where the person and myself are actually sitting in the same field. And so there's a way in which uh, you can sit back a little bit more, relax a little bit and drop some of the concerns and distractions that are taking us away from presence with the other. It's something that we're participating in, not making happen. So um, thanks so much for sharing your experiences. I'm going to um, I'm going to reshare re the slides and we'll start to look at some of the um, kind of the ways that that the um, presence itself is defined and some of the qualities that um, help to support presence. And then we're going to engage with some of the things that take us out of presence and how to work with that. 
So there's, you know, there's, there's large bodies of work on this phenomena of presence. Um, some of the bodies of work that I'm drawing on is Daniel Siegel's work, uh, neuropsychologist, um, Doug Silsby's work around presence-based coaching. And as I mentioned, Theory U um, and the Presencing Institute's work uh, rep represented in this book here, Presence. So for a definition of presence um, from the International Coaching Federation is coaching presence is the ability to be fully conscious and create a spontaneous relationship with the client, employing a style that is open, flexible, and confident. The beautiful thing is that, you know, as, as I think has, was sort of reflected in, in some of what was shared is that we all have qualities of presence fundamentally because it's actually who we are, not something that we do. Sometimes we have more access to it than others. And when we don't have as much access to it, it's, it's the, one of the hardest things to, to discover. Uh, or to find, right? So when we're in a state of distraction or contraction or struggling with ourselves or the moment or the client that we're working with, it can feel like the, you know, it can feel like the most distant possibility of all. And so that's really the territory that, that we're gonna be in it together is how do we notice when that's happening and what are some of the ways we can work with that so that we can, you know, cultivate and uh, deepen our presence. So another um, couple other ways of framing this phenomenon of presence by Doug Silsby is uh, talked about presence as a state of awareness in the moment, characterized by the felt experience of timelessness, connectedness, and a larger truth. Very resonant with what's been shared. Uh, there's some research that was done recently by Michael, I'm not sure how you pronounce his last name, Abravano, who did it. He did a grounded theory study working with coaches to understand what some of the qualities and practices are that support uh, presence. And these are some of the elements that were found in that study. And then through Daniel Siegel's work, um, this is this is a model that uh, that they put forward, which is called the wheel of awareness, and it's that recognition. I'll just describe this briefly, but really, what I wanted to point to is what some of the research shows us around what qualities of presence can actually, um, you know, manifest in our lives. But from in terms of the wheel of awareness, there's a um, uses uses this as a metaphor to reference that the hub is awareness itself. So that's this deeper source of who we are that we can seek to open to through different kinds of practices, meditation included. Um, and then from this center of our being, we have an awareness of objects, um, objects of awareness, such as you know, what's, uh, what, what you see physically in the space that you're in or the thoughts and the feelings that you're having or noticing um, in your work with another. And so the, the objects of awareness are on the rim of this wheel and that we use these eight senses to um, support our awareness um, of, this, of the different phenomena. So we have our five, five bodily senses of touch, taste, smell, sight, and hearing. We have a sixth sense, as they call it, which is a sense of the interior of our body. There's a seventh sense, which is awareness of mental activities, and an eighth sense, which is in the relational territory. And so I think part of what this wheel of awareness points to is one is, you know, what the center of our, our awareness is or can be, as well as these different um, sensing uh, senses or sensing tools that we can use to pick up information um, so that we're more effective in our, our listening and engagement, and also so that we can track um, the quality of, of our attention moment to moment. So some of the research that they've engaged with in this organization points to um, with, the, with, the, with the quality of presence, um, there's actually these various benefits in our own, you know, in our lives, improved cardiovascular risk factors, reduced stress response, enhanced immune function, and so forth. And so the, the benefits of presence 
in our own life and work are, you know, quite tangible as well as as coaches, as we work to um, source our coaching out of a deeper quality of presence, it also cultivates something similar in clients, which can also have some of these similar benefits. In other words, it really matters. So now we're going to start to talk about what happens when we lose a quality of presence. So, you know, again, from a, I'm not, from a reflective perspective, you know, each of us can remember or recall moments where we lost a sense of presence with another. In theory, you, they talk about it as absencing. So there's presencing um, and then there's absencing. And so absencing is where we're situated more in our judgments, more in um, othering others, um, you know, because of emotional charge and in a place of, of fear. And oftentimes this can manifest in, in in you know some obviously some challenging negative qualities, um, but if you recall for for a moment an experience where you felt an absence of presence in yourself or another, and what that evoked in you, and you know sometimes you might you know that might draw up for me it brings up an experience with family members. You know I have a particular family member who shall go unnamed who. Sometimes in conversation, I can feel when that person withdraws their presence from our, you know, from our exchange or our conversation. It's almost like the light is going out of their eyes and it's a painful experience. It's a painful experience and it has a pretty significant effect on our relational space. So, so as we start to think about think together about um, you know what happens when we lose presence, one is we lose that quality of experience, quality of relatedness, but we also lose access to information. So we, as we get pulled out of our own presence as coaches, we lose access to really be able to listen to a tune and to take in um, you know the experience of another more fully and so the practice that we're going to be engaging here in a sort of you know timeless brief way is um, is doing a shadow practice and you know so so one of the ways that we can think about shadow is there's the dimensions of ourselves that as we you know as we move through our life experience were not received well by family, by friends, um, in the world, by, by others. And so this is coming from, this concept is coming from Jungian psychology, which is to say that when we encounter, when we have these experiences where dimensions of ourselves are um, not received positively, um, on purpose, sometimes unconsciously, sometimes structurally, then they can sometimes go into our subconscious. In other words, they get hidden from ourselves. And uh, you know, this is a you know, this is something that's happening in small ways and in bigger ways, moment to moment in our lives throughout you know many of our days. And what what happens, of course, is that when one aspect of ourselves that's a, that we're you know less conscious of, more unconscious about, gets triggered or charged with another. We, 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 it absolutely has an impact on presence because we're actually part of our attention is going to that um, part of ourselves that is, you know, that, that we're struggling with. And, and, and just like presence itself, which is, you know, it's not something that we have or don't have, we, it's degrees of having more or less access to it. Also with shadow, there's parts of ourselves that we're more or less conscious of and more or less unconscious about. But it's a great, um, I think it's a, a, a valuable tool for as we re recall and, and reintegrate these parts of ourselves that have, you could say, been exiled to an extent, then we have more available to us in terms of uh, cultivating our presence um, with clients. So these are the things that take us offline. Again, some of them are big, some of them are small. Sometimes we're conscious of that happening, sometimes we're not. Um, and so we're going to do a very a brief shadow practice to kind of illustrate this this idea, and um, and it also is sort of you know it's, it's a fundamental recognition of is when we have an emotional charge with another human, it could be a positive charge and it can be a negative charge, 
but it often means that there's there's something implicated in our own psychology um, that's at stake for us that may indicate some some aspect of our degrees of shadow. So we can we can um, take this sort of fundamental recognition that what we see in others we have to some degree in ourselves if you've if you spot it you've got it we can also notice that um you know you know sometimes well here, here's two other ways of, of describing the shadow phenomena when we're struggling with another um again in more or vote or overt or more subtle ways you can think about pointing a finger at somebody you know you've done this and and this is hard for me um, it can be easy to say, we always, whenever we point at another, we've got one finger pointing out and four fingers pointing right back at us. And so the, the, the gift of this is that there's something to work within ourselves. It's not to say that exactly what somebody else is doing in the world that we're struggling with, that we're doing the same thing. It might be the opposite of that. It might be that we actually don't allow that in ourselves. But, the, um, but one of the things we can pay attention to around, around shadow or trigger or charge is that, um, is that as we work to recognize these parts of ourselves, we could call it bring, bring them back home, reintegrate them and potentially heal them, then we have a lot more available to us in terms of, again, how we're, how we're present with others. We're less likely to be taken offline in, in other moments and, um, and so it's it's life giving in the sense that it 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 gives us more to work with um, in relationship to ourselves and others. So, so and then the, and then the last thing I was going to say about this by way of framing is um, you also might notice how there's sort of patterns of the ways that we struggle with people that show up repeatedly in our lives. And you know this is a little bit of a conundrum where you know if 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 you struggle with something or if, if, if we struggle with something, we'll notice it showing up over and over and over again. So whether that again is happening with clients or in other contexts of your work, it's an indication that there's something for you to work with. Um, and I'll give, a, I'll give a brief example from my own life. Um, so an area that, uh, you know, that, that I didn't, uh, an area of shadow in my own life is around um, the experience of anger. So I grew up in a family where my father was, um, you know, expressed a lot of anger in the family space. It was really hard for me. And I, um, until well into my 20s, uh, if somebody asked me, Abigail, how do you experience anger? I would say, I don't. I don't. I don't really feel angry. I don't, um, you know, I don't. Yeah, I don't feel it. I don't express it but I could see it in everybody else. So it was one of the things, it's a like coping strategy as a child is to, you know, to, to, in an attempt to keep myself safe, I could sort of intuit what anger looked like in other people. At some point in my twenties and thirties, um, I started to get feedback from people that, gosh, I was expressing anger. So, you know, Abigail, I think you might be angry in this moment. And then I would, you know, angrily respond and say, absolutely not. So I couldn't quite see my own anger and how it was showing up in, in you know in my own being so this is this is a stronger example of you know of doing shadow work but there's more subtle forms of that that show up in, in coaching in coaching work that we can pay attention to and you know seek to integrate so that we again are able to deepen our quality of presence and bring ourselves back to be available again when we've been taken offline a little bit so so I'm going to guide us in a in a simple um, shadow practice, and then um, and then a couple more pointers for how do we cultivate presence when we've lost lost access to it, um, and then we'll have some conversation. So I'm going to invite you to uh, think about uh, an individual that you struggle with. It could be a client, it could be in another professional context, but. Um, there may be a degree of a pattern to this, as in you find the struggle with others, or it might just be more of a one-off, but, but take a moment and, and, and call to mind someone that you, um, you struggle with. And as I had mentioned, you know, shadow itself can be both positive and negative, but probably better to, in this moment to work with something that you, you know, that might have more of a negative quality to it. So a quality of another human that you find yourself emotionally charged by and or in conflict with or struggling with. 
And when you've come up with that person, just do a little bit of a, a reflective writing where um, you might uh, imagine that you were having a, you were telling them what you're struggling with them about. So it could be, you know, you could write their name, let's say, and then just a short paragraph around what's hard for you with them and, and don't hold back. So one of the things around shadow is that, you know, we often want to be perceived as good human beings who are kind and respectful and well-balanced, but in this case, let yourself really express the struggle. Strong and clear language. Take a moment to do that. Take a couple minutes. And now um, you may not have finished, but you've you've gathered some of the content. Now look back over the content and uh, re read what you've written or reflect on what you were thinking about and, and underscore or circle, underline what um, the parts of your writing that you know have a bigger charge for you, or a little bit are more challenging, are really the essence of where you're struggling with this person. And now um, I'm going to ask you to open your mind, your heart, find a sense of trust, and ask yourself the question, how might I also have this in me? And allow yourself to be bold, to have courage, be vulnerable, and honestly, See if you can locate one aspect of what you've written about the other that might also be in you. It could be the opposite. In other words, they do this thing that I won't allow in myself, or they do this thing that, gosh, I think I do in other, other settings. So with courage and care for yourself, identify one or two parts that might actually speak to something about yourself. And there's ways in which you can imagine, like when I gave the example of anger, it was hard for me to acknowledge my own anger because of the harm I'd experienced in the face of somebody else's anger. Um, but there's actually a gift in anger, clearly. Anger, you know, when we're conscious of our emotional patterns and we can use the, the emotion to, you know, towards a positive end, um, rather, to, you know, to make use of it rather than to be had by it, um, then there's a gift to be um, discovered in that particular quality that I had uh, hidden from my own conscious awareness. So, so when you have identified maybe one quality that you might also have in you, and this might take some additional reflection, but consider what the, what the gift of this part of you might be. It may be that um, by not seeing it, you were trying to protect something in yourself, but ultimately it, it as a part of you um, has a need and it also likely has a gift that you may not have yet discovered.
And so for the sake of our mutual learning, we won't, um, we won't have you share, you know, obviously the, the more personal dimensions of what you're reflecting on in the chat, but, but share in the chat if there is some kind of a potential insight, potential learning for you in, in um, the exercise that we're engaging with. So, so where are you in the process? And um, can you see some of the, the possible contributions to reclaiming this part of yourself, the gift it might hold for you or the impact it might have on your presence? I'm gonna put those questions in the chat and if you have something to share, please do. empathy and self-awareness. So one of the things, the qualities that we absolutely need to bring to any form of shadow work that we do is, is, a, is a sense of empathy and care for the self. Um, because when we give ourselves a hard time, it's a, it's a way in which we actually makes it even harder to, to grow and develop. So it's, it's a sense of understanding and um, and care for for you know there's there's reasons that there's these parts of ourselves that are a little bit out of our conscious awareness. A gift of letting go. So there's some of the qualities that that cultivate presence. A sense of honoring boundaries is, is something I'm interpreting from, from something that's been sh shared here. Understanding when I'm judging. Grace and embracing healing. These are some beautiful, beautiful um, gifts or insights arising from this kind of practice gift of learning to reframe. So as, as folks are sharing some of their experiences, um, you know, just to recognize like, obviously we just, we just, this is just a very brief touch into shadow work. Um, one of the, there was a request for um, some resources around shadow work and I will be sharing those. Um, what I do want to encourage us to notice as coaches is, you know, throughout our day as we're working with folks, we can notice those, those moments, sometimes they're micro moments where, where we feel a charge um, with some an emotional charge, again, could be positive, could be, could be negative. And at the end of the day, take a moment to, to reflect on whatever we're, you know, our attention is kind of drawn to or we feel charged by there's oft, oftentimes something in ourself that this is activating and we can just spend a little time reflecting or journaling on how do I also have this in me um, and and that very practice alone can help to um, bring us back to fuller presence um, and then also and also help us recover some of the parts of ourselves that are fundamentally gifts, but may have been a bit distorted in, in, um, in their expression in the self because of, you know, because of experiences we've had prior, previously in our own lives. And there's a lot more work that can be done around shadow work, but this is just kind of a pointer to that phenomena um, and the role that it can be, that it can play in taking us out of presence um, with ourselves and clients. So, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on a couple more points and then we're just going to open into conversation together. Um, I am going to reshare the slides to do that. 
Um, and so shadow is the fundamental recognition of what we experience in another, we likely have in ourselves in, in some form or another, and finding that, finding compassion and understanding, um, and then ultimately healing and integration can actually help us stay more present to when that shows up in a, in a, in a client. So for instance, let's say somebody who's struggling with strong emotions and you have a hard time accessing that in yourself. Um, doing some work to find that in yourself is is part of what makes room for a deeper sense of um, of, of empathy and attunement. Um, so here are some some pre we talked about some of the things that that take us out of presence, and these are some of the practices that can support us to deepen presence. Um, so and and we've referenced a number of these, but there's meditation, breathing, nervous system integration doing some individual and relational work, in, uh, individual collective or relational work with others is, is one way to, um, to work with and deepen our own relational presence. Um, and then working with shadow practices, uh, setting healthy boundaries and so on and so forth. Um, and then I wanted to point to one more uh, potential resource and then, and then we'll have some conversation so this is also coming out of Wendy Palmer's work. Wendy Palmer does work around leadership embodiment, um, in particular bringing in, in practices from Aikido to, to leadership um, embodiment and presence. And I was referencing this earlier when I was kind of giving a metaphor of, and I'll just use my own experience as an example. Under, in a moment of stress with another human, uh, we tend to be in this more horizontal or elliptic attention. So that is where you know, if there's a stress in my space or a stress in a, in a relational moment with somebody, our attention tends to go out towards that other person. And that can, that can show up in the form of, you know, defense or disagreement or conflict or anxious attachment, just a little bit of stress, um, but it's, it takes us out of a deeper presence. And so the, the move that Wendy Palmer's work points to is to move into a place of dropped attention. So to actually bring our attention back to ourselves, be with, in, with ourselves with care and curiosity, what's happening in me, body, mind, um, emotions, and what do I need in this moment? So, you know, as coaches, highly aware of what it means to be sitting with another virtually or in person, have some attention for them and what their experience is. But if, if our own attention, um, or if we have tension in ourselves and that's pulled away from the other, then the next move is maybe it's counterintuitive is to actually bring our attentions more, more deeply back to ourselves. What's happening? What's, what do I need in this moment? And you can do this in very subtle and micro move ways. And then to move from that dropped attention into an open attentional field where we include the other. So, um, so again, in a moment of stress, we tend to go out towards the other or we retreat, we can drop our attention into our body, mind, emotions, and then we can open our attentional field to include the other. Um, and so this is just a it's, a, it's its own form of a sort of pathway to return to a deeper presence. And from there, I'm going to stop sharing and open for conversation. So um, shared quite a bit. Uh, everybody's got so much to bring to this conversation. So I just wanted to open the space for, for conversation together. And, um, and, and as we're in this conversation, also just to ask the question, you know, what are you noticing around your own coaching presence? What supports and nourishes it? And what's a challenge that you're working with around coaching presence? And then we'll then we'll open up for conversation. You can put questions in the chat or you can raise your hand and, and we will um, learn together. Hey, Abigail, real quick. Um, yeah. Heather Holly asked a question earlier. What mm -hmm. shadow work books would you recommend? Yeah, so, so one thing I'll do is I'll, um, I'm gonna share, I'll share the slides and I'll, I'll connect some resources on those shot slides. There's a number um, that I would recommend and, uh, Robert, Robert Augustus Masters does quite a bit of work around shadow work. Um, and then there's a few articles that I have around, particularly for shadow work for coaches um, that I can, that I'll, I'll reference in the slides. 
Any other reflections on coaching presence, places where you have questions, curiosities? or anything that you experienced or, or are curious about from the, from the shadow practice or anything else that I pointed to. What do you find for yourself in your own practice around coaching presence that supports it and or thwarts it? Yes, you can even pay attention to the kind of access you have in this very moment to a deeper presence. Gwen. Hi, Abigail. Um, Hi. Great session. Um, I just wondered if there's something specifically that you do if you feel like you're being triggered in a coaching session or in working with somebody that you deliberately undertake. Yeah, there's there's a number of things. So one is just noticing. That's that's you know that's that's a big move right there. Noticing that that's happening. Um, number two is seeing what I can do to regulate my own nervous system. Um, and so I personally find that breathing really helps with that, um, grounding, feeling my feet on the ground, and then ultimately opening into a deeper trust. So that sounds paradoxical because it's hard to trust when, when we're triggered, but I know that there's a, there's a, there's a place of trust that's, that's beneath the fears or the, the contraction. And so while I'm listening, I'm working with what's going on in myself to, to see if I can access that, that place of deeper trust. And then also sometimes it calls for a little bit of honesty. So it could be, I'm experiencing this right now and I just, you know, I just wanna let you know, or, um, or it could be, so that's the, that's the sort of honest, uh, transparent communication. The other is going to vulnerability. That, that for me is one of the biggest moves, which is when I'm in a, in a, in a moment with somebody and there's, a, there's some kind of a charge and I'm not able to kind of recenter um, and come back to presence, then, then what in me is vulnerable? And can I give voice to a little bit of that? Even if it's just to say, I just want to acknowledge in this moment, feeling some stress. I wonder if you're feeling it too, or just want to acknowledge in this moment, you know, whatever the, whatever the feeling is. And so this depends on the kind of coaching session it is, the kind of relationship you have with the client. But oftentimes when you're feeling it, they're feeling it too. And it's, so it's in the space. And so if somebody can actually point to the fact that it's in the space and if the coach can do that, it, it really can make a difference. Um, and that's a hard thing to do. It takes a lot of courage. It takes context awareness. Is it appropriate with this client in this context? and it can make a, diff a big difference. It can really open things up. And I'd love to hear other people's strategies too as you're, as you're raising your hands. So um, John, I think you might've been next and then Jimmy following. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, it's not so much a strategy as, 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 an, as an admission. And, and that is uh, in, in a long-term coaching relationship um, with, uh, with a client who's highly resistant to a variety of different techniques and, and overtures to try to help them move forward and out of the stuckness. Um, what I'm realizing, I've realized in myself, uh, the degree of frustration that is, that is uh, compounding. And, um, and I think you've answered a lot of that just in the last sentences, Abigail, but uh, is, how to deal with my own growing anger around the resistance and the my up just the inability to take in all yeah. a variety of different approaches but recognizing that in myself and saying okay how do i look at that shadow and yeah how could i have been maybe more vulnerable in this in this case that just i had no more energy for 
Yeah, John, I, it's such a, I mean, I really appreciate you being willing to share that because, you know, I'm, I'm, there's many, many of us here would, would relate to that in some form or another. It might look, you know, we might experience it differently, but it's, but something along those lines, right? Like we're, we're trying to get somewhere. We're trying to support something to happen. It's not happening. Um, again, one thing is to just acknowledge what's happening. And that could be also verbally with the client. Um, so sometimes when we're, when we're aiming for something or we're trying to make something happen, the focus is on the, you know, the so-called goal it may not be the goal that the client has, first of all. Second of all, um, just rather than trying to overcome or, um, uh, yeah, overcome what's happening is actually to just accept what's happening to some degree. So noticing this, wondering about, so going to curiosity is the other thing. So one is the naming, noticing that this is going on and we, we, we um, you know, maybe there's a little bit of a, a struggle here or a little bit of a resistance between us or some, you know, something's not going well. Let's get curious about what's underneath that. What's happening here? Um, so that's the, that's a move that can make a difference. So, so now we're, we're naming a couple principles here. One is vulnerability. Another is the inquiry and curiosity. Um, and then, and the third is the acceptance, accepting what's happening, naming it, and then, and then seeing if there's a way to, to sort of back off from that place where you're, where you feel like you're fighting with somebody and you're getting frustrated where there's anger coming up. Thank you. Jimmy. Hi, thanks. Um, let's see. I'm, I'm mindful of time. I, I feel like we're just getting started and we could go another 30 minutes probably <laughs> well, with questions and dialogue. But um, I'm wondering, I feel like I want to get better at this, need to get better at this. And I'm wondering if it conforms to the typical rules of like skill building and habit formation. Um, and it may not because, you know, the efforting part of it may actually get in the way. <laughs> and so uh, like, what's the experience of getting better at this? Does practice make you better or is it something that you never absolutely. get to a place where you do it naturally. Uh, what's your your experience there? No, absolutely. No, this again. This is I. I think it's sort of the slightly paradoxical nature because it's actually yeah. The the over efforting gets in the way, but but we also need to you know we need to be engaging um, you know the qualities that we're seeking and and exploring you know where it's going well and where it's not going so well and then working with strategies to to support that. So. Um, so I'll, I'll give a mini example. I mean, I, I do think that this also relates to personality structure. It relates to culture. There's so many contributing factors to what presence means to us, how we're engaging with presence and, and, and the kind of ways we might make adjustments. Um, so I, I'm somebody personality wise who tends to uh, leap over to the other person's experience. I lose track of myself. Um, and so that is a, that's problematic in the sense that if, you know, if the self is, isn't fully present in the, in the relationship, then, um, then, then something's really missing in terms of presence. So something I've learned to do is to track myself and my own experience, that whole thing where, where of Wendy Palmer's, which is the drop to tension. So I'll notice I'm really listening to the other, I'm really present with them, but I've lost track of myself and my own you know, presence and also thoughts, insights, whatever that I might bring to the moment. And so I, I endeavor to balance the two. Um, so it's noticing where our own tendencies are um, and also obviously working with others to get feedback, whether that's through supervision and or, um, you know, with, with colleagues and so forth. But noticing where some of the, the challenge points are, um, picking a practice to support that challenge and then, you know, and then checking in about that over time. So absolutely working with um, practices. And I do think, I know that there's, there's resources out there to support that. I'm happy to point to a few more in, in the slides when I share them, but uh, absolutely working on it. Yeah. Abigail, I'm mindful of the time. You have another presentation to deliver at the top of this hour. And I just want to thank you for your time today and bringing us your presence. Mm. Um, it was delightful. So thank you, everybody, for your time and attention and being part of these coaching and context webinars. I hope everybody has a lovely day. You will get a follow up email with the slides and resource information. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Really enjoyed it and happy to stay in touch in other forms. So be in